So uh, I want to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Elaine Ibarra is the mother of two amazing children. She is a graduate from the California State University of Channel Islands with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. She became a full-time staff member at the Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network in 2012 and has previous volunteer experience with the Channel Islands Marine and Wildlife Institute, the Ojai Raptor Center, and the International Bird Rescue Res Research Center. She is a trained and experienced oil res spill responder. She believes strongly in lifelong continuation of her education. She attends two to three symposia each year and maintains working relationships with other wildlife rehabilitators and wildlife veterinarians throughout the state of California. Please join me in welcoming Elaine Ibera. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here. And thank you all for coming to hear what we, what we have to say tonight. OK. So again, my name is Elaine, and I am the Director of Animal Care at the Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network. And I'm here to talk to you guys tonight about the refugio spill. And I'm going to start with history of spill response. So does everybody remember the Valdez? Anybody who's old enough remembers. Um, this was really the first time that an oil spill had any publicity. Prior to that, they really liked just kind of hush it up, clean it up, and move on. Um, but this spill was very different, had a lot of press. And the reason that they did is because of Terry Williams. Now, you probably will never hear of her again. I was lucky enough to see her speak, um, and she's amazing. Um, she was the first biologist who was sent to um, deal with the Valdez spill. Basically, she was a biologist. I want to say she was at SeaWorld San Diego. And uh, one morning, she went to work. And there was a note stuck to her door that said, oil spill in Alaska. And she's like, OK. Takes the note down, and she gets to work. Well, very shortly thereafter, she finds herself in Alaska uh, to deal with all of these oiled otters. There was no protocol. There was no direction. And because nobody really knew what to do, nobody wanted to deal with it. State of Alaska didn't want to deal with it. Exxon didn't want to deal with it. Fish and Wildlife didn't want to deal with it because it just kind of didn't know what to do. So um, she got to work, and she was basically told to keep everything contained and you know just kind of do her best to help the otters. Well, a picture, pardon me, a picture was leaked to the press of an oiled otter. This is not the picture that was leaked, but. Um, and she didn't leak it, but because she was the point person for the wildlife response, she was served the first of three federal arrest warrants because this picture got leaked to the press. And then we got things like this. So this is a little girl's letter to her congressman. This is off the Osper site, and I'll talk about Osper later. It says, Dear Sir, I am very sorry, but I am very mad about the oil spill. It is killing nature. It is killing the sea otters. It makes me very sad because my class is doing a report on sea otters, and sea otters are cute. <laughs> the sea otters are an endangered species. Please clean up the oil spill. Sincerely, Kelly Middlestad, Mrs. Ashley, second grade Frank Franklin School. So we have second graders who are so aware and so upset about this oil spill that they're writing letters. So this had never happened before. Um, this is uh, one of the otters that was oiled. Again, this is off the Os Osper site. Um, but that's an actual otter from the spill. So you can see how oiled he is. This part, you know, the, he's sticking to the rocks, things like that. And otter fur is not like your dog and cat fur. Um, it's much more dense. It's like the most dense fur uh, of any species and very, very challenging to clean. So in 1989, we had the spill in Alaska and lots and lots of press. Less than a year later, the American trader spilled oil off the coast of Los Angeles. So everybody was already kind of up in arms about this spill thing, and this is a really big problem. And um, the spill happened off of a very public beach, a very populated beach, so it got a lot of attention as well. Less than a year later, we had the Lambert Keene Sea Strand Oil Spill Prevention and Response Act. So less than a year um, from the American trader, which was less than a year from Valdez, we have the, um, the funds to create the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. So this is OSPR. This is the website where I got a lot of these pictures, just in case you're interested. Um, so org charts. Everybody hates these, I know. But it's really important because I want you guys to understand that a spill response is just like any other disaster. Um, this is the incident command system. And this is something that can be expanded to fit a really big incident. It can be used for wildfires. Um, uh, 
uh, riots, um, any kind of hurricane, any kind of natural disaster, any response effort that's an emergency. So the incident commander, in the case of an oil spill, would be someone from the United States Coast Guard. Up until recently, oil spills were considered primarily a marine event. Um, we're starting to expand that a little bit. I'll get into that too. Um, but right now, pretty much, it's the United States Coast Guard. Um, there's a PIO, Public uh, Information Officer, so it's this person's responsibility to get all the information and responsibly relay it to the media. Safety Officer, this is really important. Um, this is something I really feel strongly about. Um, you want your spill response to be safe, just like any other emergency response. You have to make sure that there are safety protocols that are written, disseminated, understood, followed, etc. So really important. Um, finance section, obviously they pay for things. Um, logistics, and we can't do anything without funding, we all know that. <laughs> um, the logistics section has everything from like housing and where are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna get these people to the site, planning, um, initiates everything and makes sure it all kind of flows. They also demobilize at the end. And then the operations section is where I come in. This is where the people on the ground are actually doing the work that needs to be done. I'm in uh, the wildlife branch. So this is the org chart for um, the wildlife branch. So up here we have the director. You may or may not need a deputy director. That again can be expanded to fit the size of the spill. Over here we have uh, the recon reconnaissance group. So reconnaissance goes out and kind of takes an overall picture, finds out where the trouble spots might be in terms of where wildlife might be coming in contact with the oil, things like that. Um, next one over is hazing group. Hazing is very, very important. It doesn't sound very nice, but <laughs> what we really want to do is make sure that animals do not become oiled. So they're out along the perimeter, and they do everything from hang, you know, lions with lots of mylar ribbons to frighten away things. They have effigies of like coyotes and predator species that they'll move around to share, scare the wildlife away. Um, they, a lot of these people are munitions experts, so they do fire off blank rounds to sh to scare the wildlife away. They have a wacky, waving, flailing, inflatable arm tube man, one of those things. They have one of those. They have a fire cannon, which I think is really cool. Um, so these people basically prevent the oiling of species of animals. Um, recovery is just what it sounds like. They go out and actually get the animals, contain them safely, and um, they bring them to me in field stabilization. So this is my specialty. In field stabilization, we bring them in. We provide supplemental heat, fluids, first aid. Um, with birds, I clean off the skin mostly, um, and then I send them on to care and processing. Care and processing is um, where the chain of custody um, begins with birds, with marine mammals it begins in the field, that's another story, another lecture. Um, but this is really where the heavy lifting is. We do not wash the birds in field stabilization, we just want to make sure that they're stable enough to be transported. Now I want to make sure if this is the only message you get tonight, I want to make sure everybody understands it, please don't wash a bird. It's very dangerous for the bird to be washed. It's extraordinarily stressful. And before we wash birds, we make sure that their blood work is good, that their body condition is good, their you know, fluid levels, everything is, is strong so that they can withstand the wash, which only takes 20 minutes. If you're, even if you have to repeat it, you can't keep that bird on the table for more than 20 minutes. It's very stressful. Um, and then once they're washed, you have to waterproof them, which is, again, a whole nother lecture. Um, but it's very time consuming. So, Care and processing is very, uh, where most of the birds spend most of their time when they're in care. So these are the pictures that we saw after the refugio spill. So these are the, the local press. And it's important to see because we want people to understand that this is devastating. Um, but because people see pictures like this, they do things like this. So um, these are wonderful people doing their best, but really not doing things safely. The top picture. Um, We'll start with the friend who's holding his friend by the shirt. If he's holding tight enough and his friend falls, he's either going to let go, which doesn't help the friend, or he's going to go into the oil with his friend. So really not a safe practice. Neither of these people have protective equipment on, lots of bare skin. Um, and also the bird that they're trying to rescue, I think in the print it said it was a duck, but I looked at it, I don't think it's a duck. I think it's a loon. <laughs> and the species doesn't matter until you consider handling it. A loon is a very aggressive bird. <laughs> they have a very sharp beak. They know why it's sharp. They know what your eyes are for. And they will launch at you. They're very aggressive. So 
There's lots of routes of exposure that we talk about in terms of keeping ourselves safe. Um, skin, just absorbing through the skin can be very dangerous. It also causes burns, et cetera. But if you get poked by his beak, now you've got injection. So really not safe. Also, if you don't know how to handle the bird, you can injure the bird. Um, this picture here with the man holding the pelican. Now he's not doing this, but I'm just gonna let you know in terms of understanding the species that you're dealing with, if you hold a pelican's beak shut, you will suffocate the bird. They're an obligate mouth breather, so you have to have, they have to have their mouth open even during handling. And if you don't know that, even though you're trying your best, you might cause some damage that way. So again, he's not doing that, but look at his skin. I mean, he probably took his shirt off so that the shirt wouldn't get oiled, but now he's exposed some of the most sensitive areas of his body to oil. It's on the inner sides of his arms, it's on his neck, it's around his mouth. Very dangerous. Um, so then we have the gentleman cleaning up the beach. And again, I applaud the, you know, the desire to really want to help, but, um, well, let's see, he's wearing boots, that's good. He's wearing gloves, that's good. But he's got some of the more sensitive areas, the backs of the knees, the insides of the arms, those are all exposed in case there's like splashing and things like that. Um, also, when there is a spill, it's very important to identify the responsible party in terms of just like working together to get it all cleaned up. And so we need to keep the area really undisturbed before, before the actual process starts. So going back to the org charts, like there's a chain of command that really needs to be followed. So say you're responding and you don't really know that. You walk across the parking lot and you step in oil, you step in other products, you walk onto the beach, you're contaminating the scene. And if that's the, the spot that they test, because they do test all of the oil, we actually take feather samples in, in care and processing to make sure that they identify the actual oil that is part of the spill. And if you contaminate the scene, they can test that and go, oh, that's not ours. That's natural seed or that's petroleum, that, you know, that's a processed product, ours was crude. So it's really important not to contaminate the area. And then what's he gonna do with the oil when he's got it? It's not like you can just put it in a dumpster, right? It has to be properly disposed of. So really uh, spontaneous, uh, volunteers are a good thing if you're going through the proper channels and if anyone is interested in spill response please come talk to me I would love to get more volunteers it's always a good thing um, more people more educated um, that's the best that it gets okay so back to the officer spill prevention and response so 89 we had Valdez 90 we had the Lambert Keen 91 we got Osper and then by 1994 we have the oiled wildlife care network so this is a group of people up in Davis um, the Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network is a member organization of the OWCN, and um, this is where we get all, all of our training and networking, et cetera. This is a recent picture of the state of California, and these are all of the sites that are, um, that are OWCN member organizations. So we're pretty cool here in Santa Barbara. We've got the Channel Islands Marine and Wildlife Institute. They do marine mammals here. Um, us, Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network. And <laughs> uh, the Santa Barbara Zoo has recently become a member organization of the OWCN, so really great to have them aboard, we're really excited. Um, in terms of inland response, you can see this um, North, Valley, North Valley Animal Disaster Group, pardon me, um, they're up just north of Chico, and since this map has been created, we also have um, a facility near Tahoe and another facility out in Bakersfield. So inland response is something that's kind of up and coming and we're talking about it a lot more um, because really we've got railway, um, we've got pipelines, even a truck tipping over, right? There's lots of oil that's transported um, on land. So has anybody heard of the Grove incident? Can't see, sorry, no? Okay, the Grove incident happened in Ventura. And the reason you probably didn't hear about it is uh, when it happened, the press all rushed out there to cover, oh, there's another oil spill. This was less than a year after Refugio. Um, but it didn't make it to the beach, and so, you know, basically everybody went home. It wasn't a big spill, but it was still an important spill, and it was important to learn from because it was inland. It happened in the hills above the, the St. Bonaventure High School. It was a residential area, and basically it, it spilled and went down into a gully, like a dry stream bed. And so this is behind people's houses. And um, so we had a terrestrial, uh, <laughs> terrestrial concerns. What are we gonna have? We're gonna have raccoons, we're gonna have terrestrial birds, we're gonna have all kinds of species that, don't, that you don't typically find in a marine environment. So we started kind of really thinking about that. So the OWCN is the only organization in the world 
that focuses its effort on wildlife. There are, everybody who traffics oil basically has you know, response protocols and, and cleanup protocols, things like that, but we are the only group that focuses our efforts on wildlife, so pretty proud of that. Um, there are four basic tenets to the OWCN, readiness, response, research, and reaching out, and readiness. So this cool truck, this uh, trailer, is the MASH. It's the Mobile Avian Stabilization Hospital, so really cool. Um, it's loaded on campus at UC Davis at all times until it needs to be deployed. This is inside the MASH here. You can see all these crates and things. Um, it's stocked with everything from personal protective equipment, crates, medical equipment, shade for the humans um, in case it's a hot, hot uh, area. And this is the inside and closer to the front. You can see it's like a clinic. Um, there are all medical supplies that you need, gavage tubes in case you need to hydrate these birds, everything that you would need. And we do full deployment drills. Um, I've done a couple of these, they're actually really fun. They roll the truck out, disconnect the trailer and take off. So you have to go in, find the binders, figure out how to level the trailer, turn on the generator, make sure the water is running. It's completely self-contained. You unload it, lay everything out so that you're ready to receive the animals. During these drills, they had previously planted stuffed animals out in the field. So the recon people have to go out and find the animals, fill out the paperwork, send them to us. We fill out more paperwork. There's a lot of paper involved <laughs> in these kinds of things. You have to document everything. Um, and then we have to coordinate with transportation to get these animals to uh, primary care. So a lot of training, a lot of training. Before the refugio spill, I, I estimate I have um, well over 100 hours of just training. Um, in terms of readiness as well. We have um, a conference or a get-together every year. On the odd years, we go to Oilapalooza. Oilapalooza is the, the symposium that they have every other year. And so all the member organizations come together and we talk about what's happened in our organizations. We talked about anything that's new. There's always new research, the groundbreaking stuff that we're learning about oil and wildlife. Um, and on the even years, we have the summit. This is kind of a new thing. Um, it's, there's only been two of them, I went to both. But this is where we get together to write protocol. We identify problems and gaps in the program and write protocol. And in 2018, all the protocols were about inland taxa. So how do we um, respond to inland spills? What are these species that maybe, if we're all marine bird people, we don't really know how to handle a raccoon. Um, we can identify the local experts, that kind of thing. So we're always kind of thinking about how we can do it better. So I'm gonna bring our story back to Terry Williams, because again, I'm a big fan. Uh, but in terms of readiness, uh, she didn't, well, she wasn't ready. Nobody was ready. Um, so she was up there doing the best she could. She figured out how to wash these animals. Now an otter has been colorfully referred to as a chainsaw in a fur bag. They're extremely aggressive, they're very fast, and they're big, if you've ever seen one up close. I mean, they're a big animal. So chemical restraint is used. That means they anesthetize them to be washed. So she had to figure out all of this stuff just kind of on the fly. Um, and she washed them and they looked good and they were a good body condition and they were eating and they were dying. So she had to figure out what was going on. But again, nobody really wanted to deal with it. And so they just kind of said, you know, for the ones that don't make it, just put them over here, we'll take care of them. You go deal with the living ones but they continued to die and continued to die. And she was you know, frustrated and scared, and so she stole one who died. And she necropsied it in her bathtub. Not a safe practice, don't recommend it, but she had to figure out what was going on, and what she learned is that they're dying of respiratory disease. So you saw the picture in Alaska, it's cold outside. So everywhere they were doing this response, they had the windows closed, they had the doors closed, because it was cold, no ventilation. So, she figured that out. That was the second of three federal arrest warrants because she stole an otter. But really, uh, that one actually they served at gunpoint. Uh, but what she learned is the, the importance of ventilation and we were inhaling these fumes. So not only did she start saving otters, she probably saved a lot of humans. We have to be safe and we have to know what we're doing when we go into these things. Um, I'm gonna read something here. Pardon me while I put my glasses on. Okay, so she said, quote, 
I realized that each individual has to take part in the conservation effort for it to work. I saw that the people who were most effective in dealing with this environmental disaster and its effect on wildlife were the scientists who had the expertise with the animals and the knowledge of how they lived in their environment. The most important lesson from 1989 was a lesson of preparedness. In 1989, there was no oil wildlife plan. There was no veterinary experience or even the soap to clean the otters. Today we have the equipment and a dedicated, educated team of experts poised to respond to the inevitable oil spill. And that's the really important part. It's not if there's gonna be another oil spill. It's when and where, so we wanna be ready. Like any emergency crew, we're on call 24 seven, and for the oiled wildlife, it'll mean the difference between suffering and life. So, again, big fan. <laughs> okay, so. The next basic, ten basic tenant of the OWCN is response. So here we have, you know, the Coast Guard helicopter. They do fly over. Get rid of those. Uh, they do fly over and survey the area. This is the hazing group. That's the fire cannon. Super cool piece of equipment. Um, in terms of the rescue on the beach, that goes is that starts as soon as the area is, has been determined safe for people to go out and capture the animals. And it's ongoing um, until all the oil is collected, contained safely and removed, and then we're still out there for another, depending on the size of the spill, a couple of days or a couple of weeks, just to make sure that we didn't miss anybody. Uh, I'm sorry that this picture isn't more clear, but it, I, I like it because it illustrates how many different animals. All these boxes have an individual animal in there with their paperwork and whatnot. You can see these people are wearing their PPEs, personal protective equipment. And um, so in the room, everybody's lined up. You have this kind of triage situation. So you have the most critical care people here. These are the guys who are hardly oiled. Maybe they can wait a little bit longer, but you have to make these decisions about how you're gonna care for the animals. And then here we have the wash. So again, PPEs. They're, they're wearing Tyvek, which is a non-permeable substance. Um, their gloves go up past their elbows, so there's no contact with the skin. Um, they're actually even wearing like a, a bib, like a, an apron over the front, so a little bit more protection. And then the full face shield. It's not just eye protection. When you're doing this, you actually need to protect all of your skin, so full face shield. Research. So um, Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network participated in a research study a couple of years ago. And Becky Elias is here holding a duck. And the duck has a tube down its throat because, again, a lot of these animals don't feed in captivity, especially when they're under the stress of a spill. Um, so we tube feed them. And the, the line coming out of that tube is connected to um, a meter reader. And it's a, a calibrated thermocouple. And what it's doing is it's taking the temperature inside the bird, essentially the stomach of the bird. And we were testing the temperature of different gavage fluids and seeing you know, how effective is it to actually raise the internal temperature of the bird. And the truth is 110 degrees Fahrenheit is your target <laughs> temperature, so we figured that out. Also some things about dextrose and seabirds that nobody could have predicted. Um, so research is ongoing and it's really um, come a long way. This picture here is of common MERS, and if you can see the little antennae, they have backpacks on, so they can send information back. Um, they keep, when they do this kind of thing, they keep the birds in the aviary for a while to make sure they're behaviorally appropriate, that they're preening, they're comfortable, they're symmetrical, they're not causing any damage with the backpacks. <coughs> Pardon me. This is a pelican who's being fitted with a backpack. This is one of the, <coughs> pardon me. This is one of the refugio birds. And I'll talk more about backpacks in a little bit. Um, <coughs> pardon me. This is a band on a pelican. So International Bird Rescue is where all of the birds went. Uh, that's the care and processing station for, in, for the refugio spill. International Bird Rescue always bans their birds anyway, but they added a second ban for the refugio birds. So if you see a green banded pelican, that's one of ours. Um, if you see a blue banded pelican, that's one of the other IBR birds. In any case, if you see a banded pelican, let us know. And if you can get the number off of the tag, they made it nice and big so you can see it, try to see that and then let us know which bird you saw and we'll make the report because they really do like to know. It gives a lot of information about how well they're doing out there. And outreach, so obviously I'm here today. I love this kind of thing. Um, and this is actually Sue and me outside the mash. Thank you. Um, so this is us outside the mash that's at a, uh, 
an oil of palooza pardon me. So this is Tim Williamson. He's the one who coined the phrase chainsaw in a fur bag. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he's actually got some otter pelts um, for the kids to touch and really understand how different that is from their cat or dog fur. This is Becky again with some kids in PPE, so teaching them about safety and, and that kind of thing. And then this is the uh, World Seabird Conference in South Africa. So the OWCN is a California organization, but the outreach is international. It's really, really quite amazing how far we've come there. So May 2015, refugio spill happens, and I remember um, I was actually driving back from the oil, uh, Ojai Raptor Center, <laughs> and uh, I got a call from Nancy Anderson, and she said, you know, the spill rumors are true, we have been activated, the term activated is very crucial in spill response, basically it means that it's, it's the incident command system is in, in practice, and we're setting up layer after layer, and um, she said, would you like to be activated, and I said, of course. I was very excited. It's my first spill. I know that sounds weird to be excited, but you know I've been training for this, and I really just want to help. Um, this is my first bird, and this pelican is more than 100% oiled. You can see inside his mouth is oiled. It was in his ears. The whole outside of the bird was covered in this crude, and it was very strange. These birds, the, the first couple of birds, when the oil was still very fresh and unweathered, um, they had this weird layer of sand on the bottom of their feet. It was almost like a sole of a shoe. And it was almost like a centimeter thick of sand and oil. It was very abrasive. And so again, in field, sta in field stabilization, I provide supplemental heat and fluids. And then I try to clean the skin of the animals. Um, washing a bird's very dangerous, but if I don't remove the oil from the skin, from the pouch, the feet, um, it sits on there long enough, it can cause some pretty severe burns. So I, that's what I did. And this is me trying to get the oil out of the inside. We also don't want them to ingest the oil. So I'm trying to get the inside of the mouth first. Uh, back here, you can kind of see some syringes here that's filled with sterile saline in a bucket of warm water to warm. And I just flush the eyes, flush, 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 flush the eyes to try to get the oil out of there. These are the next two birds. And you can see this guy is not 100%. But where he is oiled is the front of him. It's all over his beak because he's been trying to preen it. The only way a bird can clean itself is to preen with their beak. And so they're going to ingest it. It's a very dangerous thing for a bird to be oiled. They also cannot thermoregulate. They don't stay warm. So the only thing that they can do to stay warm, especially they're probably not feeding when they're under this much stress, so they use all of their fat stores. And then they start to go into their muscle. So really got to get these birds quickly. The guy next to him, you can see, is maybe not 100% on the outside, but he had complete oiling inside his mouth as well. And he's like, Ugh. you can see by his, the way he's laying, he just doesn't feel good. It's a really, really horrible thing. So lots of unexpected things happen with every spill. They're always different, but this one was very unique because the whole team for the OWCN was in Alaska when the spill happened. They were holding a conference <laughs> and uh, so they had to basically phone it in, and they did a really great job. Um, they, one or two of them were able to leave, but a lot of them couldn't leave for three, four, five days even. Um, so they learned a whole lot about maybe keeping someone at home <laughs> once in a while if they need to, uh, just in case. Um, so again, this is the MASH, the Mobile Avian Stabilization Hospital, so it's supposed to be for the bird people, but the marine mammals were having an unusual mortality event. That's what a UME is. The sea lions had a heavy pupping year, there was no food, so they were already in trouble as a population. They were already kind of dying off and lost starvation, and then they got oiled. We actually had more marine mammals at the refugio spill than they'd ever really seen in one place, with the exception of huge, huge, huge spills. So, um, so the, marine, the MASH, Mobile Avian Stabilization Hospital, got taken over by the marine mammal people. That's okay, they needed it more than we did. Um, so the Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network site was the field stabilization for the refugio spill. We weren't out on the beach like we'd all trained to be, it was at our facility and so we had to continue to do our work. Um, just so you know, we do about 3,300 animals a year. Um, so that was all going on, and this is May, this is beginning of baby season. It was very, very uh, intense, a lot, of, a lot going on. The other unexpected thing was the fact that we got pelicans. So it, the mash has carriers and all kinds of things, but when we talked about it previously, we're talking about ducks 
and loons and uh, shorebirds, things that are smaller, the size of those carriers that we, that we use most of the time are like a cat carrier. It's a small container, not a pelican. <laughs> no pelicans could fit in there. Uh, so we learned that. We have to be a little bit broader in what we think we're going to get. Um, we got one scrub jay. So this is not, oh, sorry. Uh, this is not the scrub jay that was wild. It's just a really pretty picture of a scrub jay, so you know what they look like. Uh, but yeah, we had a terrestrial bird, and you're like, oh, didn't train for that. So we learned about that. And this is just kind of a cute little anecdotal thing. Um, this is a fish and wildlife officer who rescued a crab. We don't usually rescue crabs. <laughs> But her thought was, and this is kind of closer to the end of the, of the response, her thought was, it's completely oiled, it's going to be scuttling along the beach, a gull will eat it, then the gull will, will ingest the oil, and then the gull's going to die. So she picked up the crab, she cleaned it off really quick, and it was released back <laughs> into the wild. Um, this is uh, an example of the documentation involved. Now, this high-protein dog food bag, for some reason, the OWCN has hundreds of these brand new unused dog food bags. So most of the time we use these to collect things that, that are no longer living. Um, but you can see there is the, um, the, it says oiled crab, so usually the species goes on there. The date, the actual GPS coordinates, um, and they go out several decimals. So it's really, really precise location information and then the people who um, gather the animal. These two other charts are things you can also find on the OSPR site and uh, the uh, more horizontal one uh, talks about how many birds were collected alive and dead, how many mammals were collected alive and dead. We do collect the dead animals, um, and some of them had nothing, they did not die because of the spill. They've been there a really long time, you can totally tell. I saw a pelagic cormorant that obviously had been deceased for a long time, but A, we want to clean up the beach, and it's still oil left on the beach if we leave that animal, and B, we want to test it. We want to know the depth and the breadth of the contamination, so we collect the live and the dead. And these are just the, the, you know, the species and the breakdown of the other animals that were collected. Backpacks. So um, I'm very proud to say and very humbled by this, but all the birds that we got were indeed cleaned and released. And they were, um, I did 11 out of the 12 birds. <laughs> and they were fitted with backpacks. And they also caught eight control pelicans, so wild pelicans who were not affected. And they fitted them all with backpacks and released them all in Ventura and Santa Barbara. Um, to see if they were behaviorally appropriate after the spill. So great, we get them, we clean them, they feel good, they look good, and we send them out there, what happens? You know, so it's very important that we follow through and we analyze the data. I mean, the data analysis after a spill is huge. It's a, it just months and months and months going on um, to make sure that we've looked at all aspects of it. But you can see, even though they were all released around Ventura and Santa Barbara, Blue up here thought Oregon is cool. Uh, this turquoise guy thought that Ensenada might be better. And there were some who kind of hung around. And actually, a lot of the pelicans who were hatched off the islands here do end up in San Francisco. So this is a total normal distribution, totally normal distribution of pelicans. Here's a picture of the pelicans with the backpacks on. Again, they keep them in the aviaries for a couple of days and make sure that they're moving normally, that they're preening, that they all um, seem to be tolerating it pretty well. You can see the harness on this guy. You can see the backpack on this guy. So they're going to keep them a little while longer, and then we release. So, um, thank you. <laughs> um, so this pelican does have a backpack. You can see he doesn't. You can't see the harness anymore. His wings are symmetrical. He's ready. He's like, let me out of here. You can also see the. This is the federal band. So all of the international bird rescues are released with a federal band. It's a small. Uh, aluminum band, and it's got information that you can call back and report. Uh, I do get these birds in every once in a while, not the pelicans, but once in a while I'll get an abandoned bird into care. I report it, they can tell me where the bird was banded, approximately how old it was, or at least how long it's been since it's been banded, so we get a lot of information from those. And then you can also see his green band, because he's a refugio bird, so that's pretty cool. And they flew off, happy ending. Thank you so much. So the question is, what do we clean them with? And the truth is, we clean them with Dawn. <laughs> um, there, it's pretty much the industry standard. I will say that I do wish that the Dawn commercials, and the Dawn commercials are actually filmed at International Bird Rescue. Um, I do kind of wish they would say, please, for, for professional use only on birds. Um, but 
yeah, that's the truth. There's also a pre-treater um, called methyl soyate that dissolves the oil a lot better, makes it a lot easier to, to be removed. Is there anything else? Yes? What happened to Terry Williams? That's a great question. Um, so uh, she never discussed what the third federal arrest warrant was, but apparently that one was under uh, gunpoint as well. Um, she came back, she went home after the spill, she lost her job, she lost her house. She has since, yeah, yeah, they really vilified her. Um, but she has since recovered and she's, um, as you see, she's still speaking about it. And she spoke to us at Oilapalooza. That's where I got to hear her. She was the keynote speaker at Oilapalooza. And um, it actually kind of makes me a little emotional. But the last part of her speech, which is why I really re always remember her, she's like, it was terrible. But I, you know, I don't regret it. And the biggest message that I can tell you is don't be afraid to take risks. It's important. Ah, makes me want to cry. <laughs> Good time. So yeah, she's fine now. <laughs> So the question is about natural seeps and at Santa Barbara Wildlife, because there's so much, and our jurisdiction is Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, so there's a lot of natural seep. And we honestly probably get oiled birds, especially at this time of year, every day. Um, and in terms of the numbers, I'm sorry I don't have those in my head, but there's... Honestly, most of them are pelagic birds. So a pelagic bird is a bird that doesn't come on land unless there's something wrong. Right now, we're having an event with the oiled grebes, the western grebes, and some clarks. Um, and that's just because all the natural seep, because we've had all these storms, it kind of pushes all the, the oil together. It tends to accumulate in the same places that the grebes like to hang out. And since they don't come out of the water um, until they're really in trouble, they're oiled. Um, they do beach, that's how we get them. We don't do water rescues, that's not a safe thing. <laughs> um, but when they beach, we're able to get them. And they really only beach when they're desperate. Um, they're pretty emaciated by that point. They're, you know, they've ingested some oil, it's, it's yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, I have not seen any increase in the natural seep since refugia. Yeah. Um, how many of the total birds were we able to save and how many died? Um, personally, I can only speak of field stabilization. Um, all of the birds that we rescued survived and were released. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, for the actual numbers and the actual breakdown, you can go to the OSPR site. You can find me after if you want questions about that, but um, you can find the actual totals online. Yes? Well, that's a good question, too. Waterproofing is really hard because we can't do it. The birds have to do it. And they have to feel good enough to do it. So once a bird is washed, the process is to put them on water, and, and let them preen. Usually they start sinking and they're not waterproof. And so you take them off water, you take their temperature, you put them on under like a heater or a, a blow dryer. We use pet dryers like they do at groomers. And then you put them back on the water. And maybe this time they can be on the water for 10 minutes before they start sinking. Then you take them off, you take their temperature, you dry them, you put them back on the water, maybe 15 minutes. And then you do the same thing over and over again until the bird is waterproof and comfortable on the water for 24 hours and then they go. Yeah, but it's very, that's for one bird. Very, very time intensive, a lot of work. And you have to know what you're looking at to know if the bird is in trouble, because if you don't get them out of the water in time, they become hyperthermic and the whole process starts all over again. The question is, where do we get our funding? Um, we are a 501c3, we're a nonprofit, so all of our funding is donations and grants. Um, come, come see us. So the question is about triage and, and the, the more affected species and things like that. The, the species who are probably the hardest are going to be the more fragile species, which tend to be shorebirds, um, long skinny limbs, things like that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the most captured or the most oiled. They're just the hardest to deal with. And then the other factor in triage is the actual condition of the animal. If they're more oiled, obviously that's higher priority. Um, if they have been, if it's later in the spill and the product is really weathered and you think they've been eating the product, like they've been oiled for a long time, versus an animal who's recently been oiled. Um, so there are a lot of factors to that. Oh, um, I don't have a lot of information about that. Um, the person who was the main biologist for the brown pelican uh, retired a few years ago, right after they were delisted. And as far as I know, um, there hasn't been anyone really to pick up that gauntlet. So we don't have a lot of good information, but I will tell you that for a number of years, we didn't have a lot of pelicans in care. And most of the pelicans that we used to get were just starving juvies who hadn't quite figured it out yet. And we haven't been getting them until this year. So from what I see, it does kind of seem like maybe they're starting to breed again. Um, pelicans are cognitive breeders. 
So they were choosing not to breed for a number of years for whatever reason. They know what they're doing <laughs> better than I do. Um, but it, it, it kind of looks like maybe they're doing it again just based on my experience. Good question. Um, so she's asking about the, the waterproofing process for mammals versus the waterproofing and cleaning process for birds. So um, everything that you do to a bird is going to be more stressful for the animal than for mammals. A lot of mammals will, ha will need chemical restraint, just like the otters. Um, it's kind of funny, you didn't ask about amphibians, but for amphibians, you dunk them in water over and over and over again, and they secrete kind of a, a slime, so it comes off, no dawn. <laughs> they really ab absorb everything. Um, so, and then there, with, um, with mammals, waterproofing is not really a thing. So aquatic birds are waterproof. Terrestrial birds are water resistant. So for birds, they have to restore their, the structure of the feathers. It's got nothing to do with the uropygial gland or the preen gland. That, they have a gland on the, back of their, um, on the back of their body that produces a conditioner which keeps the feathers supple but it doesn't have anything to do with waterproofing. That's actually a structural component of the feather. Um, fur, you could literally, if you needed to shave off a patch, you could shave off a patch, get rid of it. So not nearly as traumatic for the, for the mammals. Anything, so the question is about how what we do impacts the waterproofing. Anything you do to a bird disrupts the feathers. And if you've ever played with a feather and you know you, like, you go in the direction of the feather and it's nice and smooth and you go in the opposite direction and it goes pfft. Right? So everything that we do disrupts the structure of the feathers. The, um, the feathers have a central stem, for lack of a better word, and then it branches out, and each one of those branches has little hooks on it, so it actually interlocks. That's the structure that keeps the water waterproofing. So you ha the birds have to restore that interlocking mechanism, the barbules on the feathers, for them to be waterproof. Um, the natural sleep is natural. And I was recently told that we are the second largest next to the Caspian Sea in terms of the volume of oil that's secreted naturally. And whether the oil rigs were there or not, I mean, this is a whole nother topic and I'm gonna try really hard to stay away from it. <laughs> um, in terms of like, does it make it better? Does it make it worse? That's not my field. But it, it, it would happen whether they were there or not. 